Hello everybody, welcome to the United Stand. Sir Jim Radcliffe has given his first full interview as Manchester United's partial owner. And wow, he's spoken about Mason Greenwood's future. He's spoken, spoken about Dan Ashworth. He's spoken about Sheikh Jazim and whether he actually exists. Um, he's back to the Glazers as avid United supporters. There is so much to unpick. I've not actually read it all because I thought, you know what? Let's go bloody live as a community and let's do what we do. Let's react to it together um, without bias or prejudice. So we're going to go straight into it. A lot of people asking about Luke Shaw. Wait for the seven o'clock show. We're here to talk about uh, Sir Jim Radcliffe's first full interview. Uh, some Christopher says it's spin, spin, spin. Well, let's get into it. I'm going to just say right at the start here, he can't slag off the gray Glazers. He can't say Mason Greenwood's for sale. He can't big up Qatar. I mean, look, we want the truth. We can handle the truth. But we still live in a world of corporate bullshit where the, the truth cannot come out. We still li live in a world of PR and brand where the truth cannot come out. So just remember as we're answering some of this, and I don't know what he's going to say. I've not really read any of it. Um, some of it could be protective spin because he has to do that. He's contractually obliged. Anyway, Let's get into it. So first things first, Sir Jim Radcliffe is a 27.7 stake uh, holder in Manchester United now. And uh, basically in a wide ranging interview, he discussed his preference to build a new stadium which would serve the north of England, working with the Glazer family and trying to emulate rivals at Manchester City. Well, look, I don't agree with the new stadium. So straight away, um, I don't agree with that. It's not something I'm going to chain myself to Old Trafford about, but I don't agree with it. So uh, let's get into it. Um, right. There's a lot been said, Robin B. It's not a pointless interview. Interview, so let's go straight into it. Uh, on being a Manchester United supporter, I was at primary school in North Manchester and in my class half were pale blue and the other were red. My family were red. I automatically became a Man United supporter from the age of six or seven. It's an important element of my life and hugely important to all Manchester United fans. Without question, my favourite memory was Barcelona against Bayern Munich. I was there with my son who was about 11. The last three minutes were unforgettable. It was a remarkable moment ingrained in the mind and that is what football is all about. On pursuing a deal, he said, it's been my boyhood dream, but they never come true normally. This is the exception. It's ruled by the heart. This is not financial investment for me. If I wanted to make a financial investment, I would buy another chemical, com chemical company. And also, let's not forget, Chelsea. He tried to buy Chelsea. He tried to buy half of Barcelona. So he's, he's right. You know, Manchester United is the club that he supports. He was trying to make a financial investment with Chelsea and Barcelona. This, he says, is the heart. It's very much taking on one of the great challenges in the world. It's a very worthy challenge and very exciting. The only reason I got involved is because I wanted to see Manchester United restored to where it should be as one of the biggest clubs and well-known clubs in the world. It should be playing the greatest football in the world. He spoke about the challenge ahead. There's so much to get through here. Get your comments in. Um, Radcliffe on the scale of the challenge ahead and he has spoken about Mason Greenwood and he has spoken about Dan Ashworth um, it's been clearly been a difficult 11 years since Alex Ferguson and David Gilt re retired it's not switching a light switch it's not a simple short term fix we have to work to the right solution not run to the wrong one the short term issue is we want to get in the Champions League it's a two to three season challenge to get the organisation and environment right to get the performance on the field right and win football matches that involves the design and structure of the organisation being correct I think that's massive. I was talking about this last night, so I can't disagree with this. It's a two to three season challenge. Therefore, you've got to look at that dressing room and go, who's going to be here in two to three seasons? And should they go on the journey? Because you still will need people to go on the journey that fall away at the time. He says, in the last 11 years, Manchester United have had a lot of coaches and nobody has been very successful. That says to me there is something wrong with the environment. It's not constructive for me to blame anyone. It's just a fact. My focus is on how I change that. Uh, environment to get the best out of the coach and squad. Well, look, I'll, I, 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 I think it's constructive. The reason, Sir Jim, this club is where it is, is because it's been run by a family that bought us on debt, have got no interest in this football club other than to make money, and have made bad decision after bad decision, appointing mates as CEO and not ha providing a structure for the manager. That's the truth. I know you can't say it, but that is the truth. He's then been asked about the Glazers and he said, look, I only know Joel and Avram, and they are, despite what you might read in the press, very nice people, very courteous, and they are avid supporters of Manchester United. I understand the frustrations and the angers, but I am looking forward, not back backwards. Well, I'm going to jump in on this. This is just PR. He has to say this. We already know in his contract he can't say anything negative about the Glazers. So when asked about the Glazers, if you can't say anything negative, 
you're probably only going to say something positive, aren't you? I mean, if they were avid supporters of Manchester United who only cared about Manchester United, then they wouldn't have done what they've been doing for the last 10 years, which is bleeding the club dry, taking money out, making bad decisions and ignoring everybody who told them Get a proper CEO, get a proper director of football. So Jim Radcliffe's done it in his first month in charge. If they were avid supporters of Manchester United, they would have replicated that obvious business model a lot sooner. Um, he says, we've got to be patient and try to build Manchester United back to where it should be, which is one of the very elite clubs in the world. The key to working is the relationship we will have with Joel Navram, which in my view is a very good and trusting relationship. I think in a way it might have been the easier solution for the Glazers to sell outright to the Qataris. To be fair to the Glazers, they thought the best solution was to sell to me because they thought United would benefit, benefit more from that. I've never heard such bollocks in all my life. Come on. So so, so what, we, what we're saying now is we... What we're meant to cheerlead the Glazers because they sold to you and not the Guitaris. And actually, am I reading this right? To be fair to the Glazers, they thought the best solution was to sell to me because they thought United would benefit more from that. I've never heard such shit in all my life. Come on. You say it best when you say nothing at all. Protect yourself, Sir Jim. We're, we're, willing, to, we're willing to get behind you in the positivity. But we can't swallow... The Glazers didn't sell to Qatar because they wanted to sell to Sir Jim because it would be better for the club. No, they've never done anything better for the club. They've sold to you because they want to keep the club and increase the value of it. They've not sold this club because they think... They've not sold to you because they think you'll make Man United better. They've sold to you because they think they'll make more money. They haven't not sold to Qatar because they wanted to do what was best for Man United. They've never done what's best for Man United. We're going to have to get a new stadium because they let it rust. Come on, I mean, I'm not... Look, I'm not against Sir Jim. I want him to do really well, but I'm not going to swallow, and nobody is going to swallow, pro-Glazer bullshit. And there is no way in a million years that the Glazers have gone, we could just sell to Qatar and make five billion, but you know what's best for United? That we sell for Sir Jim. Let's sacrifice that five billion to do what's best for Manchester United. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. We wouldn't be moving out Old Trafford if they'd actually done what's best for Man United and keep it intact. We wouldn't be where we are if they'd actually not taken dividends and stuff. Come on. You know, we've got to be even handed here. Uh, Radcl Radcliffe on Sir Jim on recruitment on and off the field. Ultimately, the level we want to get Manchester United to is not always where we're at. That takes time. It's not just about the players, it's the whole machine. There are thousands of people in that machine and we need to get that machine working well. Agree with that. We need to be as good as anyone else in the game at recruitment and we haven't been. Financial fair play is a new element in football and a really important part of managing the football club really well. We'll assess how much money we have available and use it well. We've spoken about this. There'll be hundreds of millions available. So Jim, just do, just do what needs to be done. There's a few open goals. Get rid of players, make the money, put it into the club and invest it well and don't overpay. We have to find the best people in the world, ensure they have the right character and personality. Perfect. I love this. And create the right environment for elite sports people to be successful. All we're doing is to try and to, to drive performance on the pitch. I love this. It has to come true. This is exactly what I've been talking about. We need the right people with the right character and the right personality to create the right environment for the elite sports people to make us successful. Some people were arguing with me last week when I said, when we look at a player now, we've got to look at their backgrounds. We've got to look at their personal life. We've got to look at their personality. We've got to look at how they behave off the pitch. This is how we drive change at this football club. And this is why we failed over the last 10 years. So I like this sort of approach. On the pursuit of Dan Ashworth. So a big topic here. He says, I think Dan Ashworth is a 10 out of 10 sporting director. One of the best around. This is big. This is big. This is from the owner of Manchester United in relation to the footballing side. So Jim runs the footballing side. He's talking about our next director of football, who is currently an employee of Newcastle. This is a massive statement. I think Dan Ashworth is a 10 out of 10 sporting director, one of the best around. He'd be very good for Manchester United. It is understandable that somebody like Dan would see the Manchester United job as a very interesting challenge at this stage of his career. Ultimately, you can't really criticise him for looking at maybe the most coveted job in football as a sporting director, particularly with the challenge at Manchester United. What doesn't make sense is for Dan Ashworth to be sat around doing nothing for 18 months. And I think what we're talking about there is it's clearly something that Manchester United are concerned about. And um, this whole gardening leave stuff. 
look, for, for Sir Jim Radcliffe to be talking about Dan Ashworth like that, this deal will happen. He's on gardening leave at Newcastle, but there clearly is some issue around this 18 months that we're going to have to look at. Uh, uh, M.A. Singh says, Goat Bridge, I've been watching since 27,000. Thank you very much, mate. Appreciate that. Uh, get your thoughts in. Um, I'm just going to summarise everything that he said and you can have your thoughts on it. We've spoken about what he said about the Glazers. We've spoken about the need for elite uh, sports people at the club. We've spoken about Dan Ashwood there and how it's ridiculous that he could be on you know, garden leave for 18 months. On the Mason Greenwood situation, this is what he had to say. And there's a little bit more to bring in as well. But he said... Um, Look, we need to look at the facts and judge fairly and take into consideration what the values of the club are. Then we can come out of that with a decision. It's not appropriate for me to comment on Mason Greenwood at the moment. However, I think there are potentially a couple of stories sort of floating around because I read something very different um, about um, this, which was, and I'll find it for you. I don't, I don't, there's so much, there's so much sort of, flying around at the moment it's difficult to know what's what but Mike Keegan has put an article out about Mason Greenwood as well saying that Manchester United owner has left the door open for Mason Greenwood to return so uh, Mason Greenwood may have a Man United future blah 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 however speaking for the first time since his 25% stake in Manchester United was ratified Sir Jim Radcliffe has said, with regards to on-field matters, United have strongly suggested that Greenwood would never play for them again. However, Rick Sir Jim had a different stance. He said, it's a fresh decision. I can't talk about the principle. I can talk about the principle. I'm not going to talk about Mason. I'm familiar with it. The principle is the, mo is the most important thing. We'll have other issues going forward. You're dealing with young people who have not always been brought up I, I, um, in the best circumstances who have, who have a lot of money and they don't always have the guidance they should have. What we need to do when we have issues like that is understand real effects, not the hype when we need to make a fair decision in the light of the club's values. That's what we need to do and that's how we will deal with it. Um, we need to look at facts, judge fairly and take into consideration what the values of the club are. Then we can come out of that with a decision. It's not appropriate for me to comment on Mason Greenwood. So, look, I, I, I don't I don't think you can read that either way. And I, and I would urge anybody not to read that either way, because some people will be very um, some people will think he's bringing Mason Greenwood back and some people won't. I, 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 my interpretation is that he is answering the question in a very political way it do almost doesn't make sense you know when somebody a polit politician gets asked a question and they they answer it in a long-winded way and you sort of go well he could mean that he could mean that what does he mean what he's basically saying is that they will assess the information and make a decision in the summer um i'd be very surprised if the decision's any different to the one we think it's going to be i think he will be sold in the summer because does Ineos want that to be their first big decision? We're going to bring Mason Greenwood back. I'm telling you now, there are Man United fans who will go mad about this. There are there are media that there's, there's so much negativity that will hit United if they bring Greenwood back. So Jim's not stupid, but if he brings him back, it's a big choice. I don't really, I don't really want to get into it. It's not my decision. We've we've been through this before, but you know. Does Sir Jim Radcliffe want to be coming out with statements about bringing Mason Greenwood back and the Glazers only sold to him because they care about the club? I mean, you know, he's got to be very careful about how he runs it. Of course he has. Um, but I don't think it means Mason Greenwood's going to come back. I think it means what I've been saying and you've been saying for the last few weeks is that he's doing very well in Getafe at the moment and United have got options. Um Look, first and foremost, it's, it's it's 40 to 50 million pounds of pure profit that goes into the transfer budget. So, look, there's a lot to be said there. He doesn't say he's coming back. And I think anybody who says that he is, is, is you know, a bit of a bullshitter, really. But um, there is a lot more to talk about. And, of course, throw your opinions in. Um, he was asked about Mesa, Manchester City and Liverpool. And he said, when Man City played Real Madrid at home and won 4-0 last season, that was the best football I've ever seen. What? Shut up! What are you on about? How can you how can how can you watch Man City and and and, and rim them like that? Um, what? I can't believe what we're talking about here. David Moyes got into trouble with this. So when Man City played Real Madrid at home and won four 0 last season, that was the best football I've ever seen. If we can ever get to that point, it would be a great achievement. In the North West, we have two neighbours who are really impressive football clubs. I want to knock them off their perch. Um, we are friends in the sense that we are all in the Northwest, but they are our biggest enemies. They are clearly our biggest competitors in the UK. 
We are a long way behind. It's not going to change tomorrow. People unfortunately need to give us time to get back. It will be two to three seasons. Patience is needed. Spending money lavishly in the summer is not the solution. It is much more complicated than that. Well, uh, you know what? Fascinating. Fascinating stuff. I'm reading this live with you, by the way. So I'm reacting to it live. And a lot of the time I read stuff, think about it, then I'll go live. I still say what I think, but I'll probably be a little bit more time to think on it. It's like an instant match reaction. I mean, I don't like anybody that says Man City played the best football I've ever seen. I mean, fucking hell, you just said you're in the, the, the new camp. I mean, the best football I've ever seen was that season of the of the treble. Like, that's the best football I've ever seen. I don't even like the way Pep plays football. I don't like tiki-taka, pass between the lines, don't take anybody on, keep playing in between the lines, pass, pass, pass. I don't, I don't even like that style of football. And I, I don't think last season's Man City is the best footballing team they've had either. So I don't agree with that. I don't think they're the best football I've ever seen was Man City against Real Madrid. And I don't want to get to that style of football because I don't like that style of football. So, you know, I disagree with that. What I do agree with is, is that it's we're a long way behind them. I agree with Sir Jim on that. It's not going to change tomorrow. Um, it, you know, he said two to three seasons. These, you know, I've got to say, I've, I, I really have enjoyed this interview because it's given me a lot of you know, stuff to go away with. It reminds me of a Ralph Ranyuk interview, really. There's a lot of clarity in there about where we're heading. The, the takeaways for me, and I'd love to know what yours are. Let's get into your... I mean, I've still got a bit more to deliver, but I, I would love to get some of your takeaways. The takeaways for me is that, obviously, he's bigging up the positivity of the Glazer relationship because he has to. Um, the takeaways are that Dan Ashworth is the man that we really, really want. The takeaways are that the team and the squad is going to change a lot around mentality, how they conduct themselves, and also age against wage. If it's going to take two to three years, why do you keep 31-year-olds who are on big money? So I'd, I'd be worried if I was a Varane or a Maguire or an Ericsson, or maybe even a Casemiro. Um, but look, in relation to this spending, it's the second time we've had it directly from Sir Jim and we had an Ineos source to The Telegraph yesterday Basically, we're getting the same message coming from the owner now. This is not some source. This is the this is the owner's mouth saying spending is not the way to do it. It's not the solution. It's much more com complicated than that. Patience is needed. Two to three seasons. So, look, this is from the mouth of the guy who runs the football club, Sir Jim Radcliffe, and he's basically saying... There won't be lavish spending this summer. That's not the way to do it. It's more complicated than that. And it's going to take two to three seasons. Um, I agree with you, Chun. Tick, ticky tacker football's boring. Sir Alex Ferguson's football was better, 100%. Um, so, look, I, I do start to think about things. And a lot of United fans are saying we need a left back, two centre backs, a right back, a holding midfielder, a box to box, a winger, an attacker. That's eight players. If we're not spending lavishly, we're not buying eight players. Because lavishly isn't just spending £89 million on Paul Pogba. Lavishly is spending three, four hundred million. Well, if you want those eight players, you're going to have to spend about 300 million quid. If we're not going to do that, then maybe this summer's not going to be the clear out we thought it was going to be. Maybe this summer we don't actually get rid of as many players as you think we are. Maybe we're not going to get rid of that many. Maybe we just get rid of two or three. Maybe just Varane, Casemiro and Eriksen go. And we keep Maguire and we keep Lindelof and we keep wan and we keep Shaw and we keep um, McTominay and we keep Rashford and Bruno and, you know, maybe, maybe even a Sancho. I don't know. We assume it's going to be a biblical summer uh, in the sense of, in a footballing sense. But I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, look, it's the second time we've heard it in 24 hours and we've just heard it from Sir Jim Radcliffe that spending is not the way and it's not that simple anyway. It's complicated. So we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. But look, two to three seasons probably upset some of you. Uh, I would hope the majority realises, you know, what I realise, two to three seasons to compete is what he's saying. Not win it. Don't get lost in winning it. Two to three seasons to be competing with the Arsenals and the Liverpools. So, yeah, uh, if it's two to three seasons to compete, that means next season's going to be like this season and the season after, potentially, because, it, you know, they're going to be in it for the long run. Um, let me know what your thoughts are. Constantine says, in fairness, what if after two to three seasons and we're, on, we're not challenging for the title? 
Uh, Dan John says, afternoon, Mark. Thanks for all that you do. This will be Sir Jim's first major decision. Both decisions to this story might cause a stir within United, uh, says Dan. And would Ashford compensation come under financial fair play, says Ben? No, I, I don't think so. And Terp says, proof will be in the pudding, whatever Sir Jim Radcliffe says. And I have got some more to come back with as well. Um... There's so many quotes coming out here. It's um, it's incredible. Um, I think he's has he done like more than one interview, or is it, I, I know the BBC one I've read, but there's a hell of a lot more out there. Um, what do you make of the coach Eric Ten Hag? Well, I don't think it's appropriate for me to talk about individuals in that organisation. What I would say in respect of the coach uh, is that if you look at this last 11 years, Manchester United has had quite a few coaches and some of these coaches are very capable um, and they've been very successful, but nobody has been successful in that Manchester United environment for the last 11 years. Uh, so that would say to me, that there is something wrong with the environment. And uh, he was asked who's to blame for that. And he said, it's not constructive for me to blame anyone. Look, I I'm not worried particularly about Ten Hag at this point. I think that would be um, it's absolutely stupid to start making changes there. Um, the knocking up, the look, it's not lost on me that he said, I'd like to knock Liverpool and Man City off their perch. That is plagiarism. And it's, and it's nice. You know, it's like, um, it's like remaking a classic film. Will it work? Because that's a, that's a ten that that's a Sir Alex Ferguson quote. He ca he said when he came to Man United, he wants to knock Liverpool off their perch. So that is a that is a Sir Alex Ferguson quote modified for 2024 by including them as Man City and Liverpool this time. So interesting around that. Um, just trying to pick up on some other stuff here um, about enemies. Yeah, we spoke about that. Um, yeah, we spoke about that. Um, yeah. Uh, he was asked about the Dan Ash with £20 million pounds, um, um, release clause or whatever you want to call it, a compensation. He says, I think it's a, it's silly, um, personally. I don't want to get dragged into that. What I do think is completely absurd is suggesting a man who's really good at his job sits in his garden for one and a half years. We had a very grown-up conversation with Manchester City about Omar Barada. When things got done, we sorted it out very amicably. They could see why he wanted to take the challenge. You look at Pep. When he's done with one of his footballers, he doesn't let want them to sit in the garden for one and a half years. He doesn't do that. That's not the way the UK works or the law works. Um, United have won. Um, I think, you know, I mean, look, basically, he, he sounds like he's somebody that's, um, you know, very forthright in his opinions, which is good. Um <laughs> This is this is interesting. I mean, look, I, I, I thought this was a fake quote. Um, Rick Radcliffe defeated Qatari businessman Sheikh Jazim, who wanted to stage a full takeover of the club. And um, this is this apparently this is in the Daily Mail. So I presume this is a, this is a real quote. He said, still nobody's ever seen him. Actually, he said the Glazers, Glazers never met him. He ne I'm not sure he exists. So, you know, Sir Jim there having a little bit of a shot at the Qataris, maybe. I don't really, you know, know, know what to think about that. But um, look, lots of stuff there. Lots of stuff there. And um, Sir Jim said on MUTV that he and the Glazers don't own the club. The fans do. And they are merely stewards of the club, says Dark Sparks. Yeah, but that's not the last 20 years. Sir Jim can't speak for the Glazers. The Glazers have run this club into the ground for 20 years. Um, they've not been stewards of the club. They still own 45% of it. I'm, I'm very positive about Sir Jim's positivity. I think we all are, but he can't bring the... What he can't do is... I don't mind Sir Jim having an umbrella and being shielded from all the shit, but he can't invite Joel and Avram in and say, you know, get under my umbrella. He's not Rihanna. You know, he, he can't do that because they are not to... He's, what, 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 what's dis, the only thing that's disappointed me in there is what he said about the Glazers because... He's basically saying that the Glazers only sold, sold to him because they thought he'd be best for making Man United great again. And he's also saying that the Glazers know that they don't own the club. They're just stewards of the club. Sir so Jim can say that. He's got a clean slate. We'll get positive about him. The Glazers can't come under his umbrella, Ella, Ella. They can't. They can't because they've not treated the club like it's our club. 
They've not treated the club like they're just stewards of the club looking after it. They've let Old Tra Trafford go from one of the best grounds in the world to what will be rubble. Anfield is going to stay Anfield for another 50 years. Old Trafford is going to get knocked down because of the Glazers. That's their legacy. Old Trafford should not be being knocked down to the ground. If they kept on top of it over the last 20 years and kept renovating it, then we'd still have Old Trafford. That's the Glazer legacy. Debt on the club, £2 billion worth of debt that's cost us and still costs us. Dividends, failure, bad decisions, a football ground that's going to get knocked down. Don't come at United fans and tell us that the Glazers are good people and that the Glazers have got the best interests of the club at heart and that the Glazers don't see it as their club, they see it as the fans' club. They've never, ever treated us like that. So Jim needs to be very careful about what he says about the Glazers. I know he's got to work with them and we'll deal with that. Fans will get on board with that. But don't start rewriting history about the Glazers being good people and the Glazers having the best interests of the club at heart. We're the only owners who take dividends out. We have let Old Trafford rust. The debt has grown and grown and grown. They put bankers in the position of power in a football club. They do not deserve a second chance and everybody knows that. They, they have to lie in the bed that they have created. All the people who protested, all the people who walked away from the club and set up other clubs, you know, they weren't wrong. They weren't wrong about the Glazers and Sir Jim knows that really. Sir Jim just needs to get on with building his legacy which hopefully is to rebuild Manchester United. He doesn't need to try and spin for the Glazers. That's the worst thing he can do. Doesn't need to bring the Glazers in along. He can speak nicely about them and he can say that we're working together, but he doesn't need to. I don't like listening to, oh, they're good people. Yeah, you know, that you can't rewrite what they've done to this football club. And Sir Jim would do well to steer away from that because it will only taint him. He just needs to focus on himself, be positive about the Glazers' working relationship, but let's not pretend that they're not responsible for the last 11 years, the last 20 years, um, certainly. Not even eight players, Mark. The left-back situation is killing me, says Dan John. Fernandez is gone. Malassia is missing. Regulon is gone. It pains me to see a top left-back like Shaw gone. Well, I'll be talking about that on the 7 o'clock show, Dan. Um, love that, uh, of course. Financial fair play, says Toon, means teams have to penny pinch. Newcastle don't get bullied anymore. They have proved it in recent transfer markets, says Toon. Yeah, but you don't get bullied. People just walk away from your project, your most important person. Yeah, your director of football was basically setting your strategy to rebuild your football club and he's walked away. Uh, what about Sir Alex, who always talks up the Glazers as the ferocious? Mate, uh, look, I really don't want to... This is this is the, the only reason... I'm not going to talk about it again. I don't want Sir Jim talking about the Glazers like that. I can't stop it, but I don't want it. It's irritating. It, in, in a lot of positivity, there's an irritating point in there. He doesn't need to do it. And hopefully the feedback he gets from the people around him will be, yeah, probably don't talk about the Glazers like that anymore because people were protesting. People were marching. You know, the Glazers are not going to get a second chance with the United fans. They're not. As I said, Old Trafford's going to get knocked down because of them. They're not going to get a second chance. The best thing the Glazers can do is go into the background and stay quiet. Like they have done always anyway. They've never got involved. They've never interacted with fans. And now because Sir Jim's here, you can't just come running along with it, you know, arm in arm. Leave it to Sir Jim and what he's building. And, uh, you know, hopefully it'll work. Um, a lot of people talking about the Greenwood situation. Look, the, 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 the definitive quote on Mason Greenwood was not that he's coming back. Just that there's a new ownership and we'll look at it and see how it goes. The Dan Ashworth situation is really interesting. Um, and I think that, look, there's a few takeaways for me. I think obviously what he said about the Glazers we've discussed. Dan Ashworth really, really wants him and thinks it's stupid that he'd have to do gardening leave for 18 months. So watch the space on that. The Mason Greenwood situation will be resolved in the summer. Um, 11 years of failure. We need to bring a structure in. I think he also said in a quote earlier on that, you know, the manager at Manchester United has to answer to the CEO. That doesn't work in the modern game, which is what he's basically saying is there needs to be a structure between the manager and the CEO, which will be built. And I loved what he had to say about, you know, personality, how people conduct themselves, mentality, all these things in relation to building a big sporting excellence within Manchester United, because ultimately it's the players. Patience is key. He has to get the right people in charge, says Adrian Cox. As much as I don't want a new stadium, the income from a new stadium would be greater for FFP, says Adrian. Mate, 
I don't want Old Trafford to go. Sentimentality, I don't care. It's it's a church. It's it it, it 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 should be listed. It never should get knocked down. That's my stance. Some will agree, some won't. I'll tell you now, it's getting knocked down. It's getting knocked down and it's getting rebuilt. And that's horrible. I went um, a few years ago, I was at the Emirates and I walked from like Marleybone there. It took me about an hour because I, I just like walking around London. Um, and on the way to the Emirates, I walked past Highbury and I got, I went, I felt something at Highbury, even though it's flats. They basically turned the outer facade of Highbury into flats and gardens. I went from Highbury to the Emirates. I felt nothing at the Emirates. I was like, it's just a modern stadium. It's just a modern stadium with a massive walkway around it. Highbury even now feels like it's, you know, got something about it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not massive into new stadium. Look, the Etihad is very impressive. The complex around it is very impressive. When you're not there on a match day, it's soulless. In fact, it's soulless on a match day. It's the same atmosphere. Um, I've not been to the Spurs stadium. I don't know what it's like, uh, but same thing happened. Look, I wouldn't. Not, I want Old Trafford to stay, but I'll sit here honestly and say financially, there's only one choice to make. They're going to have to knock it down and build a new stadium because the Glazers neglected Old Trafford to a point where we just can't do anything with it now. I think it's very, very sad. I think I think it will get knocked down, and I'm very, very against it. But I'm also realistic. Um, yeah. Uh, Gary Neville's going to knock uh, knock Old Trafford down. Thoughts as to I mean, look, there's so much to talk about today. We've got another show for you at seven o'clock. Um, so Gary Neville's apparently going to get involved in the Manchester United committee to rejuvenate and build around that area. So Gary Neville's going to have a key part in knocking Old Trafford down, isn't he? But it's not Gary Neville's fault. It's not Sir Jim Radcliffe's fault. Um, it's the Glazers' fault. Um, I don't think for one minute Gary Neville or Sir Jim Radcliffe would want to knock Old Trafford down if it had been kept like Anfield has, where you just keep re renovating and repairing it every year. The trouble is, if you've got a car on your drive, imagine you've got a Ferrari on your drive, right? And you take it for a service every year, you change the tyres, you get the oil changed, you give it a clean. That Ferrari will last you for years and years. It will become a collector's item. It will last forever because you've looked after it. The same Ferrari left on your drive for 20 years, you don't do anything with it, it's going to rust and it's going to get to a point where someone's going to say, we can restore it, but it's going to take bloody ages. You may as well just buy a new Ferrari and that's exactly what's happened. You can't blame Gary Neville for that. You can't blame Sir Jim Radley for that. Um, and if I was on that committee, which obviously I wouldn't be, and everyone presented the facts to me, I'd probably say this bloody hurts me so much to knock Old Trafford down, but the obvious choice is we've got to. Financially, we've got to. Um... The interesting thing about Gary Neville being involved about that is that there's a whole area around Old Trafford that needs that's going to be renovated. Well, Gary Neville's massively involved in the city centre and buildings and obviously hotel football is just a small part of that. So um, as, a, as a business person who knows the area, I, I, I you know, the, the, I haven't got a problem with that at all. I haven't got a problem with it at all. Um, it reminds me how Ronaldo talked about nothing changing during 10 years in the Man United Stadium and wealth centres, says Vladimir. Uh, Constantine says, I don't like the Glazers, but I also think Edward would shelter some of the blame for our performances over the last decade. Of course he does. And Richard Arnold and John Murta and, you know, anybody else that was on the board. Of course they do. You know, it's not just the Glazers, but they did appoint them. They could have sacked them. How many times have we sat here over the years saying, if I could have a private chat with the Glazers? I remember saying it five years ago. If I could have a private chat with the Glazers, I'd just say to them, why don't you sack Ed Woodward and get a proper director of football and a proper CEO in? Why is it that you won't do that? Only an idiot wouldn't do that. Why won't you do it? Why, why don't you take the advice of people who knows what they're on about and sack Ed Woodward and get a director of football in? They never did it. They never did it because it was friends, mates rates. They, you know, they were happy with the cosy making money for everybody relationship. Um, how can we maintain the stadium when we buy crap players like Alexis Sanchez as Constantine? And uh, name it New Trafford and move forward, says Bill Alwell. I think that's probably what will happen. Canadian says they'll run the economics on a capital repair job versus capital replacement. Return of investment will play 90% of the story here with history and criticality of the structure playing the rest. Very, very economically put. Um, Mark, do you think Tuchel is possible in the summer? Oh, look, we can talk about this at seven. We're talking about this at Jim interview here and obviously get your comments in below. But um, Thomas Tuchel should go to West Ham. He's a failed Bayern Munich manager. He was sacked by Chelsea 
I mean, I wouldn't go as far as to say he's Pochettino, but his recruitment is absolutely abysmal. And he lives under the umbrella of... There's a lot of umbrellas on the show today. He lives under this umbrella of, you know, top coach. Tuchel is... He's, he's a wish clop. Like, he's not actually as good as people think he is. How do you fail at Bayern Munich when it's a one-horse race? How do you mess that up? Oh, it's a transitional year. Oh, my God. How do you fail at Bayern Munich? You, you don't. You, you don't. And people would want him at Manchester United. God, no. I don't want him anywhere near Manchester United. Maybe 18 months ago, I would. But it's a bit like Pochettino. When he left, when we were when we were linked to Pochettino, I learned a lot about Pochettino at PSG. How do you fail at PSG? How do you da how do you go to a, a club like PSG and walk away with it? You know, sacked. And and how do you go to Bayern Munich and walk away from it sacked? Tuchel shouldn't come anywhere near Manchester United. Nowhere near. And also his recruitment is terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, he did shit at PSG as well, says Terp. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, but look, it's, it's it's like it's the Sancho Brigade, isn't it? Uh, Santana says Tuchel is good. Uh, certain people in football will retain a fan base no matter what. It's never their fault. Never their fault. And Tuchel's another one. He's a bloody hipster coach that some people like, and it's never his fault. He's he's not a good coach. He's not. A, he's been sacked at three big clubs. Since when is that a good move for Manchester United? Absolutely not. Um, Mike Ashley would have bought out the Glazers. He buys shops for fun. What's that got to do with anything, Mr. Beef Eater? And when we start competing against, uh, again, that means those horrible Glazers will be turning up to all the cup finals, says Vincent. Of course they will. They want to come under the protection of Sir Jim. And Sir Jim shouldn't do that. He shouldn't. You know, that's my one takeaway from this interview. Don't try and bring the Glazers into the family of love and positivity. That's not how it's going to work. I don't think it will work with this fan base. I'd be very surprised if people started forgiving the Glazers for what they've done. They need to stay in the background and, you know, live out whatever plan they've got. I don't really know what their plan is. I think their plan is Sir Jim comes in, massively, massively improves the club, more sponsors, more money, you know, VR or TV deal. And instead of the club being worth five billion, it's worth ten billion in five years, and then they can cash out and make a lot more money. The Glazers aren't here to make Man United great. They, I mean, can I just give you a definition of the Glazers? How can the Glazers be obsessed with making Manchester United great? It's the biggest hypocr hypocr hypocritical piece of evidence you'll ever have. Manchester United were great. Then the Glazers bought us. In the 10 years before the Glazers bought us, we completely and utterly renovated and rebuilt Old Trafford. In the 10 years before the Glazers bought us, we dominated English football. In the 20 years after they bought us, Old Trafford went to ruin, the club got lumbered with debt, and we've gone from a team that used to challenge for titles to one that can't get anywhere near one. We were already a great club, and then the Glazers bought us. So, I'm not... I'm not, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who feel like this, I'm not for bringing the Glazers into this positivity bandwagon. They just need to keep their distance and stay out of it because the damage they've done to this football club cannot be undone. It can't be. Um, anyway, thanks everyone for watching. I'm back with you at 7 o'clock. Um, get your comments in below if you're not watching live. Uh, lots and lots of stuff from Sir Jim there. How would you rank his interview out of 10? Somebody said earlier... I'd give it a strong eight. I'd give it a strong eight. I don't I don't really believe in a perfect ten because it's just talk and you don't know what's gonna happen. But I liked the two to three year projection. I liked what he said about players' mentality and recruitment. Um I like what he said about Dan Ashworth. Um But I didn't like what he said about the Glazers. Um I didn't really like what he said about Man City either being the best football he's ever seen. Didn't like that. But you know, they're, they're little things. The, the the main thing is CEO, director of football, recruitment. Oh, I suppose as well, I'd give it an eight as well because one little negative as well was when he said, we're not going to spend lavishly in the summer. We can't do that. Um, that's the second time I've heard that in 24 hours and it's just worrying me a little bit about this summer's got this summer's got to be impactive. It's got to be seven, eight players out and five or six in. It has to be. And if we don't, 
why, why aren't we doing that? Because there's so many open goals to generate money. If we didn't have enough players, to, if, we, if, if we had no way of generating transfer funds, I'd be worried. I'd be like, well, where's the money going to come from? But we've already been through this. There is about £300 million worth of players that we can sell very, very easily. You know, not, not just Greenwood or McTominay or Maguire or Varane or Casemiro or wan or Ericsson or Donny van der Beek or Martial or, you know, th there's so many players we can, Sancho, uh, that we can remove and make money from. And I know you don't get any money for Martial, but his wages are off the bill. You know, we're still paying Anthony Martial 200 grand a week. It, from June, that's back. So there's so much money that we can generate that I don't agree with there's not going to be any money in the summer. But if we're not going to remove those players, we can't generate it. So my concern is a little bit, are we, so we're not going to get rid of all these players then. Are we keeping them now? So let's wait and see. He needs to keep the Glazers sweet, Mark. It's just business, says Makish. Yeah, he does need to keep them sweet, but he doesn't need to come out and start talking about the Glazers really care about this club and they're avid Manchester United fans because they're not. They don't care about this club. It's been proven. Thanks everyone for watching. I enjoyed that. I hope you did as well. I'm back at seven o'clock. We're going to be talking about the Luke Shaw ramifications and a few other things as well. Seven o'clock tonight because obviously it's Champions League night. Take care, everyone. I'll speak to you all in a bit. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Make sure you smash a like on the video. We've not had a thousand likes on the video and your new owner's just given a big interview. Make sure you smash a like on the video on your way out. And Vlad says, let's not forget about the Glazers. As long as they're here, they damage more and more. Well, that might not be the case, Vlad. You know, things might might improve, but let's not try and pretend that uh, they're not the reason that we are where we are. I'll speak to you all in a little bit. Take care.